Good morning, church. Good morning. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 84. If uh, you're visiting Christ Church, my name's Mark. I have the privilege of being one of the ministers here at the church. We're glad you're with us on this holiday weekend. And as Michael said a little bit earlier, we're wrapping up our series. Uh, we've been talking about the things about God that draw from every single one of us gratitude. There are positives to the unsaved, and there are positives to the saved. And there are distinctions. Because God delivers, because he's for us, he's not against us, he's not looking to punish us, he's looking to build us up and restore us. Because of that, every single person, no matter what they've done, can be delivered. Because God is merciful, every single one of us can change the direction we've been going and return back to God and we'll be received. Because God is for us, God wants to guide us. Every single one of us, the word of God, the presence of God guides us, shows us where to go and how to get there. And because God provides all things for us, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, we can find lasting contentment. If God gives it to us, we need it. And if God doesn't give it to us, we don't need it. And we can learn to be confident and trust. Today I'd like to bring all this series to a culmination with a very simple message. And as a holiday gift to you, a brief one. Yeah, there you are. Because God desires a relationship with us, we can have access to his presence. In the ancient world, and even in some religions today, most people had to find God by going to a location. They had to go to a building. They had to go to a, a place in the world. They would travel home, and they would go to this place, and they would bow there and worship there and serve there and God would show up in a building. And I remember being a kid growing up in the church and one of my, the greatest blessings in my life is my mom and dad are believers and they raised all four of us boys to be believers. But I had a misconception that the church building was where God spent his Sundays. And my dad and mom were uh, leaders in the church. I mean, they served. My mom taught, I think she taught Jesus in Sunday school. She'd been there a long, long time. And uh, she was always teaching Sunday school and junior church. And my dad was a deacon for a while and served at the communion. And then he was an elder in the church. And every now and then there would be meetings after church. And my dad would just keep the four of us boys with him. Mom would go home and, and probably just rest away from all of us. But she would go home and dad would keep the boys at the church. And he would go into a meeting. And they'd go into this one Sunday school classroom that was pretty big. And they would leave us kids unattended. And my dad thought fear of him would keep us and for the most part, it did. But we were four boys, and we'd find things to do. And we'd be horsing around and going in classrooms, playing hide-and-seek and drinking the Holy Communion juice when no one was looking. We did things boys would do. But I'll never forget one time, Scott and I got in a fight. I hit him with an eraser. He got chalk in his eye, and he chased me to kill me through the building. And I'll never forget this moment. I'm not going to exaggerate it at all. We're running through the Holy of Holies, right? We're going up the stairs from the basement into the foyer. We bolted through those two flapping doors into the auditorium. We both stopped running. The distance between us never changed. We both walked, got on the other side of the sanctuary, went down the back steps, started running again for my life. <laughs> I knew at that age, don't run in the house of the Lord. I think what I understood it to say was, never have fun in the house of the Lord. And I realized that God's not located by zip code. Through Jesus Christ, here's the punchline to the whole story. Through Jesus Christ, God is not located by, by zip code. He's located by faith. And it's changed church. The 84th Psalm is a beautiful psalm about going home. On Thanksgiving weekend, it's a real simple message. Many of us got to go home. Some of us didn't. But many of us got to go home. We got to go home to our parents' house or to a family house, and it, it felt like home. And for some of us, leaving that and coming back here to where we live now was hard. For some of us, we were grateful. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Some people got, as soon as Turkey was over, they were out the door heading back to their new home, and they were glad that that's over. But for many of us, leaving family and coming back to where we live now is hard because we wonder how many more of these will we get. One of the things about home that fascinates me is how comfortable we are there, how natural it is there. I still pick on my wife. When she goes home to her mom's house, it wasn't the house she was raised in, but when she goes to her, her mom's condo, Heather just barges in, opens the refrigerator, finds out what she has, starts looking in her closet. She just is nosy. But she looks at me and she goes, this is my home. And my mother-in-law corrects me all the time. She can do that. She's home. 
And I do the same thing. It just is weird when she does it. I go home to mom and dad's house. I open the refrigerator, see what they're eating, see what kind of ice cream dad's got stored away in the secret hiding place. And I help myself. I'll say to my mom, can I have an iced tea? She's like, Mark, I made that for you. You're home. Home's a special place. No matter how old you are, when you go home, you still go back in your bedroom, don't you? You still remember what it was like to be a 12 or 13 or 14-year-old kid wondering what you'll become one day. <laughs> and now I'm 50, regretting I never became that. I was going to be the left fielder for the Chicago Cubs. I don't know what happened. They missed their opportunity. <laughs> but I love going home because I can be 14 or I can be 50, but I'm always comfortable. I'm always welcome. I just, I fit there. With that mindset, I'd like to walk you briefly through the 84th Psalm to show you that God desires for you to be home more than you do. And that's something we can all be grateful for. Whether you believe in Jesus or you're making that decision, or you've never made it. I'm here to tell you, you're never gonna be home till God's where home is at. And it's not based on location, it's based on faith and the proximity of your trust. In 1 Kings 8, 27, when Solomon finished building the temple for God, he said some amazing words. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and earth and the heavens of the heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. Solomon looked at this amazing building. There was nothing like it in all the world. And he looked around and he goes, not like this could hold God. And he reminded the people that day, let us not think for a moment that God lives in a building or a location here on earth that we manipulate. Jesus said God lives in us. The spirit of God abides in us and he draws us to hope. So when we talk about going to the temple, when we talk about this, we're talking about home. And all of us want a home. All of us want a place to go to. I'll never forget when I was in college, I was a freshman. I brought some friends down to South Bend. The college that I went to in Michigan was about two and a half hours from the Indiana border where I lived on. And so we would come home for the weekend. Mom would feed us. Dad would fill my car with gas and I would go back. And I'll never forget the first time I said to my mom, we need to get back. I need to get home. My mother looked at me and corrected me very sweetly. You are home. I said, yeah, I need to go back to college. That was okay. But when that became home to me, that bothered her. Moms, are you with me on this one? We want our kids to come home. So does God. See, the point of the morning is our deepest longings can be met. This desire in each one of us to have a place where we're welcome, a place where we're forgiven, a place where all of our mistakes and all of our growing up and all of our awkwardness is erased by the fact that we belong there. Verses one and two. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul, my soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. I'm told that this language is romantic, as if the temple, the place of God, is something that this man is in love with. This romantic love, this sentimental desire to be in this safe place where both are received by one another, and there's passion. You see, in verse two, he says, my soul, my heart, my flesh, all of these things cry out. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. We talked about a thirst, a thirst that can only be quenched by God, that nothing the world offers us quenches us the same direction. None of it satisfies. You'll find this throughout the psalm. Psalm 42 is a famous one. One of the famous choruses in the 1980s that churches were singing all the time is, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. There's another psalm that says, my th soul thirsts for you in a dry and parched land. Each one of us wants a relationship with God where when we're with him, it just feels like home. Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be what? Filled. That satisfaction we've been talking about for five weeks now, a satisfaction the world can't give you. Yeah, the world can make you think you're full, but all it's really doing is creating more hunger. When God fills you, you're full. Did we understand full after this weekend, right? Anybody not have that sensation of, oh my goodness. I mean, I said something yesterday, very profound. Heather made a nice uh, meal and I said, I ate too much, again. And that's my life story. It's gonna be the title of my biography. He ate too much, again. And when you're full and really reach full to the point of painful full, do you want anything else? 
No, the Bible says that when God fills you, the only thing that will ever make you feel that good again is his presence. Or if you'll allow me to keep riding his horse around the room, being home where God is. You see, this deepest longing can be met. It's God's desire to meet it. You don't have to climb on a mountain and sit in the lotus position. You don't have to hum and chant and beg God. You don't have to starve yourself to get his attention. You just have to go home to the presence of God where it'll be met. And the psalmist says that some have found their place with him. There are some that have already experienced this. And once you experience it, there's no place like home. You never want to be elsewhere. Verses three and four. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. I think it's interesting. The psalmist notices that the birds of the fields have located themselves near the holy altar of God. And they note, the psalmist notes that God's not upset. All are welcome. God's, it's not trivial. God doesn't look and say, it's ridiculous that they would put a nest near my holiness. No, God says, no, they're my creation. They want to be close, and I want them close. And then he uses two terms that I think are significant. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'll encourage you, if you haven't thought much on it, you want to meditate this week on a passage of Scripture. Meditate on verses 3 and 4, because the way the psalmist refers to him. First, he uses the big term, Almighty God, the God the only God, the one true holy God, the all-powerful God who spoke the world into existence with his mere words, almighty God. And then he turns around and uses the term of endearment, my God. You are the man and my dad. You are all-powerful and you know me. You are perfect and holy. You care about my broken existence. A few weeks ago, and it's not, I'm gonna, not going to repeat every message, but I, see, I want you to see how this all ties together. A few weeks ago, I told you there's only four men in the world that can refer to Dale Christian as my dad. I'm one of them. I'm privileged. I can say, that's my dad. None of you can call him your dad. And the psalmist says, the almighty God who all of creation flocks to be with you, you are almighty God and you are my God. And church, isn't that good news? Some know what it is to be at home with him. You see, the house and presence of God represents the Garden of Eden with one of the favorite songs of my heritage growing up in the church. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. That song in the garden means a lot to me. The older I get, the more I realize that I have tried to live my entire life by going to God occasionally instead of living my entire life by being with him all the time being home. You see, it reminds me of Revelation 5, 11 through 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I wanted to hit pause here for a moment. I want us to look at that 12th verse. In a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. If you want to know what the world is telling you you, they can give you, they're going to tell you that they can give you these things. Power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. The world is promising you that. As Satan promised Jesus in the temptations that I can give you the world if you will bow before me, the world can give you these things. They just can't give you them to last. But it says, in the presence of God when we're home. And I don't mean in a future day. I mean that presence right now of being with God. That sense of comfort, peace, and acceptance. Peace. That in those moments, when we get around the throne of God, everything the world said we needed, we will give up to be with him. Wealth, honor, praise, recognition, accomplishment. In fact, one of my favorite passages in all of Revelation is it says, And they will lay the crowns they've received from the king at his feet. Everything God has given us is meant to be given back. Continuing verse 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. 
the four living creatures said, amen. I taught you something about a year ago. We're gonna have a pop quiz. Do you remember what the word amen? I just heard a groan, oh no. Uh, do you remember what the word amen means? Truth. It means yes, truth. It's an affirmation to say, I believe that, I testify to that. So the four living creatures cry out, that's true. And elders fell down and worshiped. The desire we have in all of us can be met, and some have already experienced the presence of God because that's what he wants. And some have begun the trip home. There's an interesting word in this. It's the word pilgrimage. Verses five through seven. Blessed are those whose strength is in you who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. This world is not my home. I'm just gonna be here for a little while. I'm headed somewhere else. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Here's the truth of this passage. When God calls you in a direction, he plans to provide what you need along the way. He doesn't ask you to provide for it. He says, I will provide for it. And they say, we're going through this valley. And in the valley, there were always pools of water. As we were led by God in this direction, there was water to quench our thirst. Do you see the thirst in the first verse and the thirst in this verse? Who provides what we need when we're desperate? God does. He provides it the entire journey. It's a clear image of a God who provides. In Isaiah 43, the prophet Isaiah gives us an example of this. It's powerful. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland. I want you to pause there. Isn't a desert by definition without water? And isn't a wasteland by definition full of things you don't need and that aren't good for you? But he says, no, we will provide water in the desert, streams in the wasteland, to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Our journey is to understand that as we are at home with God, we should remember all the nice things he's given us, all the provisions, as we pilgrim through this world, as we go from one place to the other seeking home. You see, the desire each one of us has in our heart to be at peace with God, to be in his presence, can be met. Some have received it already, and some are journeying that direction. So let's conclude this morning by looking at the fourth thing, what should be the cry of our hearts. Verses eight and nine. Hear my prayer, O Lord, God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. When our oldest son, Alex, was a little tiny guy, he'd be telling you a story, and I don't know where he picked this up, but it was really cute. If he did it now, it wouldn't be so, but it was then. He'd be three or four years old, and he'd say, look at me, and he'd take his chubby little hands, and he'd put them on your cheeks, and he'd put his face right near you to talk to you. And it was cute, and it was endearing, because I wanted to hear what he had to say, but I loved the intensity by which he wanted to tell me it. He didn't want me distracted. He wanted my eyes to focus on him, and he wanted to tell me the story, and he would draw us near. And listen to what it says here. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Listen to me. And the good news this morning is God wants to. He's not distracted. He doesn't have to say, time out, I'm running the world, what? Oh, God's like, now the world can wait. You're the reason the world is here is for you to know me and me to live with you, to be home. He says, look upon our shield, O God. Be our protection. Verses 10 and 11. This is the culmination of the entire thought about going home. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. When you're on the path of heading home with God, returning from this place, remember Enoch walked with God and he was no more. God took him home. And this passage often, for many of us, we traveled a lot of miles. For those of you that traveled a lot of miles. But I've had some of you say to me, what are you going back to Indiana? And I might say, yeah, we're going to go back at Christmas or we're going to go back in the spring. And does it ever bother you that it's 11 hours to get home? It would bother me if I had to go 11 hours to the dentist. It would bother me if I had to go 11 hours to get a vaccination. 
It doesn't bother me to go 11 hours to see mom and dad. It doesn't bother me 11 hours to go to my favorite Mexican restaurant, see my high school friends, show the boys around town places that I grew up in. It, when you're going home, the journey can't happen quick enough, can it? Better is one day in the presence of God than 10,000 days spent with something that doesn't last. So he cries out, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house. I'd rather be that close to you than so far away, so distant. You see, the whole passage here in John, chapter one, John says that the glory of God came in the flesh and he dwelt among us. Now, many of you know this, but the word dwelt is a word that means tabernacled. When God came down in the tabernacle in the wilderness, his presence came down and lit up the tabernacle and it was a holy place. And it says that God of the universe, the almighty God, our God, came down and tabernacled. He journeyed with us. And in this place of tabernacling, the presence of God is here. And the psalmist cries out, I'd rather have one day with you in a tent than 10,000 days in the greatest palace where you're not at. The presence of God. Jesus told us, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus did not come to become a zip code. He did not come to sit on a mountain. He did not come to build a building so that you and I would have to travel every year and bow on a holy piece of ground and look at a certain wall or go to a certain building or walk into this place to find him. Jesus came so that God would move with us. He would dwell in us. Church, you can be home right now because the presence of God is in us. It's with us. I like Psalm 84, verse 12. The psalmist concludes by saying, O oh Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. I'm told that the word trust in the original language means to lie down, to relax. We all know the sentiment, don't we? You get home today, kick off your shoes, put on your comfortable clothes, watch a ball game, finish the turkey, take another nap. I know some of you are going, I got to go to work. I'm sorry. I really am. I'm going home. The boots are coming off. Sweatpants are coming on. And I'm going to sit on the couch until Advent tonight. And then I'm going to come back in here better dressed. And I'm going to remember that the light of the world became flesh and dwelt among us. And I'm going to lie down and rest in this simple truth. God wants to spend some time with me. Today's the day to be with him.